Morning. 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 I don't. I'm Joe, and our visitors are who? I'm Karen, and this is my husband Brian. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice Hope to meet you in person at our next social. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> All right. Um, if I remember correctly, we were at um, we were looking at the Church of Pergamos, chapter two, uh, around verse twelve is where we started. Uh, we got down to uh, like verse thirteen, and then uh, I gave you a homework assignment. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Bill. See, I could count on Bill. I knew I could count on Bill. <laughs> The rest of you, I, knew it. I, knew I couldn't recount on. That's not fair. All right. <laughs> Let me just review a little bit. So uh, we got the Church of Pergamos. You remember um, this was a church uh, north of Ephesus, north of Smyrna, uh, uh, 20 miles inland. Um, it, uh, you'll notice also that it, it's written by, it says that he who has a sharp two-edged sword. So again, that's part of the description of Christ uh, that comes uh, back in chapter one, when we have the vision of Christ from verse 16, uh, where it talks about the sharp two-edged sword. So here we have uh, the description of Christ here. Again, each of these descriptions corresponds to the problem in the church, right? So in this particular, pro this particular church had a problem with sin. And so he's, he's, he's bringing out the sharp, sharp two-edged sword. It was really a, a judgment it was really about, uh, uh, you know, because they had this issue, he had to respond to them in that way. Um, and so we'll, we'll see that more as we get into the other churches. And then we get to verse 13. Uh, so typically with all these churches, he gives them a commendation and then he gives them a condemnation. So in 13, we have the commendation. But he starts it off with this weird statement. I know your works, uh, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And so my question that I left you with was, what is Satan's throne? So what did you come up with? Do, do, do. Pergamum was the, the seat of Roman uh, emperor worship in Asia, and there was a massive temple there to uh, Trajan, the Roman emperor. So it was yeah. Rome. Good. Yeah, so that... There's, uh, you know, we don't actually know what is meant by Satan's throne. There's a couple of different uh, possibilities. Uh, number one, as Bill has stated, is it, it was the kind of seat of emperor worship. You know, they had a they had a temple there to the emperor. Uh, they 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 did worship the emperor, no question about it. So one one very good possibility is when they talk about Satan's throne, they're talking about the emperor and it's the emperor's throne, which is there in in Pergamus. Um, the other thing, uh, a couple other options uh, there is that they also had a um, <clears throat> an altar to Zeus there, um, and again, this was a, a very famous um, um, altar throne, if you will, on an Acropolis, uh, which just means a high mountain there in Pergamos. Um, so again, that it could be referring to that. Another interesting one is that they also uh, worship the god of healing, uh, which was Asclepius. Um, now, <clears throat> for those of you who are connected to the medical community, you know about the, uh, the staff with the snake around it, right, which is kind of representative of the medical community. That's actually uh, comes from this god, Asclepius, uh, who they worshiped. Uh, he was the god of healing. Uh, the interesting thing, the way that they uh, would heal people uh, in those days is they would uh, put them down into a pit and then they would uh, fill the pit with snakes. Uh, and if, they, uh, if they came out alive, uh, they were healed. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what the, the snake of the staff is all about. Uh, so anyway, that, this was the, you know, so they worshiped, uh, this was kind of the headquarters for worshiping uh, Asclepius there in Pergamus. Um, and so, uh, again, all of those things could be, you know, the worship of Satan's throne. Uh, certainly, as we start talking about snake worship and all that, it, it kind of fits in. But uh, you know, it, it very well could be emperor worship because it was such a, a headquarters for the for the emperor. Uh, you know, 
one interesting thing here to think about is that, you know, he's saying here that this is Satan's throne, right? It's where Satan uh, hangs his hat, if you will. Uh, you know, we, we, one thing you got to recognize is that Satan uh, is on the earth, right? We think about, uh, you know, God's in heaven, but Satan actually reigns on earth. He's on earth, uh, you know, moving around, uh, you know, controlling his demons, etc. So uh, you just got to get in your head that Satan is here uh, and active and working. He's not uh, he's not somewhere else. And this kind of brings it to, to the forefront that this is his throne. Uh, you know, this may be his headquarters at this time. Um, you know, so again, remembering if, when we talked about Smyrna, um, we saw that Smyrna had a synagogue to Satan. Uh, here in Pergamus, he now has a throne uh, in Pergamus. Um, what we'll see as we go through these cities is that uh, we start seeing that the cities get worse and worse and worse. Uh, you know, when we were in Ephesus, they simply lost their first love. Uh, when we get into uh, 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 Smyrna, you know, we start uh, seeing that they have the, these Jews who are turning them in, right, because of uh, them not bowing down to the emperor. And then now we get to Pergamus, we'll see they're in much, uh, much worse shape. When we get into Lyotira, it'll be even more uh, bad and et cetera. So, so just to keep that in mind, as we go through these cities, uh, uh, not only was it the official trade route, that's the, 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 the um, order that we look at these, but it all, we also see that their sin gets worse and worse. Um, in, the, in, this, in this city of uh, uh, Pergamus, we, we never saw <clears throat> any uh, apostolic ministry that we know of. There's nothing in Acts about them uh, visiting Pergamus. Um, again, as we talked about before, um, it, remember from Acts, I think it was Acts 19.15, uh, where they talked about uh, while they were in Ephesus, uh, they, they, they went out to all of Asia and ministered to them. Uh, so it's very likely that uh, uh, that Pergamus was simply a missionary church from Ephesus, uh, that they went out and, and founded Pergamus during that time. There's no other mention of it, as I said, in, in Scripture. This is the only mention of it, as we have with, uh, with Smyrna. Um, <clears throat> all right, so finishing up, though, verse 13, right? So he says, uh, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. In other words, I know the city that you're in. I know the the pressure that you're under there with the with the emperor, etc., and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. So this is the commendation that he's given them. Even in the midst of the situation that you're in, you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith. Right. So he doesn't give up on uh, you know they they he they they're still holding fast to Christ and they're holding fast to the gospel. I mean, those are two great commendations that he has. They've been faithful to him, and they've been faithful to his gospel in the midst of this situation that they're in. And then he goes on and says, right, even, um, you did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. Now, again, we don't know who Antipas is. Um, it's very likely, uh, just from, uh, we don't know from Scripture, from the historical record, um, it's indicated that he was a leader, perhaps the pastor of the Pergamus church at one time, uh, that he was martyred. Tradition has it that he was uh, placed inside a brass bull, and then the brass bull was placed into the fire, um, and he, he died in the fire there as a martyr. So uh, the, the point, however, is that during this martyrdom time that the church still was faithful, faithful to Jesus, faithful to his gospel, even when, <clears throat> excuse me, even when their leader uh, was killed in this uh, horrible way. All right, so that's the good news. Uh, as we get to verse 14 and 15, we got the bad news uh, because it starts with the word but. <laughs> but I have a few things against you. You know, this is a, before we get into the details of it, you know, this is, a, this is not what we want to hear. Uh, from Jesus, right? Uh, hey, you're doing great, but I have a few things against you. I, you know, I don't want Jesus coming up to me and going, "Hey, I got a few things against you." You know, I think this has got to be kind of terrifying for this church when uh, they hear, "Hey, things uh, appreciate you being faithful, appreciate this, but I have a few things against against you." I don't think any of us want to hear that word, uh, and this church certainly did not. 
Anyway, I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Now, I'm not going to go back and read the whole story of Balaam and Balak. If you want the reference, it's in Numbers 23 through 25, a couple of chapters there where this whole story is. But let me just kind of give you the summary. Uh, if you may remember, Balaam was a prophet. Uh, but essentially, he was a prophet for hire. Uh, Balak uh, was the, uh, the, the leader of the Moabites. Um, he came to Balaam and he asked him to curse the Israelites such that he could defeat him in battle. Um, uh, uh, Bal uh, Balaam uh, tried to do so, but God prevented him from cursing uh, the Israelites. And in fact, he blessed the Israelites. Uh, Balak, Balak then got very upset, obviously, because his prophet was not doing what he wanted him to do. Um, so he, uh, he set about uh, uh, trying to corrupt the Israelites uh, through intermarriage. Uh, and in this, he was very successful. Uh, he he uh, intermarried uh, um, the Israelites with the Moabites. Uh, you know, he, he presented his, uh, his daughters and uh, his, uh, his uh, women of court uh, to the Israelites, they uh, intermarried with them. Uh, uh, they were a very sexually immoral people, and so they brought that sexual immorality to to Israel. And so we and we see here again in verse 14, right? So um, they hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So he's just he's he's saying that. Um, this is what happened uh, during Balak's reign. Uh, he used Balaam to do this, and he's saying the same thing is happening in your midst. Uh, there, there are those who hold that doctrine. There are, there are those who are sacrificing to idols and committing sexual immorality in your midst, and you're not doing anything about it. That, that's the real condemnation. You're not doing anything about it. There are people in your midst who are doing this, and you're just allowing it. They're, they're saying it's okay for a Christian to be involved in pagan worship and sexual immorality, and you're allowing that to happen in the church. And, and go on to the next verse, verse 15. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Remember when we talked about Smyrna, we talked about the Nicolaitans. They were probably a follower of Nicholas, uh, who was a, uh, an apostate uh, within the church, uh, who fell away and pulled away a bunch of Christians with him. Uh, again, his, his, uh, his problem was, again, sexual, sexual immorality and sacrificing to idols. It was, so they're saying it's the same, the same issue that we have with uh, the ones who are following Balak and Balaam. Uh, that we have with the Nicolaitans. Again, it's all about pagan worship. It's all about um, sexual immorality. And, and again, uh, his uh, Christ's concern here with the church <coughs> at Pergamos was they were not dealing with sin. They were, they were not dealing with it. They were just allowing it to happen. They, were allowed, they knew that there were these people within their church who were doing this, and they were doing nothing about it. So then verse 16. He says, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So he tells them, and he tells the church in verse 16 to repent. What is he telling them to repent of? All these things he just listed. Yeah. <clears throat> and what was that? <laughs> Sexual immorality. Uh, <clears throat> they allowed um, the sin to continue. The yeah. yeah, Russell actually has it right. Give, give Russell the gold star. Wow. So what do you a rare, the rare, rare, rare piece of encouragement from my Sunday school teacher? <laughs> 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 I had a good week, Russell. I had to give you a little pat on the back. There. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I wanted to make that point clear. What, what he's asking them to repent of is that they were not doing anything about it, right? It wasn't, he wasn't talking to the people who were in sin. He was talking to the church 
who is allowing this sin to go on. Uh, you know, recognize that that is a sin. <laughs> it's a sin for us to allow uh, to allow sin within the church, to allow people not to be confronted because of their sin. Uh, that, that is what Jesus is really concerned about here with Pergamos, is that they were allowing this sin to happen. I just think that's a that's a wake up call for us, right? That that you know, it's not just about you know if we know that there is sin occurring, that that's got to be confronted. And you, and you know that you know if you go back to, to Matthew, right? He tells us exactly how to do that, <laughs> right? Go and tur- go and talk to the person individually. If that doesn't work, bring a couple of witnesses. If that doesn't work, bring it to the church, right? He's saying you got to go through that process. I expect that of you. If you know that there is someone in sin in the church. You need to go and take care of that. If not, you're in sin. That's his point here. You need to repent of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, Paul addressed that same issue in, to, in his first letter to the Church of Corinth in chapter 5 when he talks about the young man who's having that affair with his father's wife. And yep, yep. Just ignoring it, wasn't doing anything about it. So I was, sa- I was saving that verse till later, Bill, but well, uh, Sorry. Yes, you're right. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Oh, that's that's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly what's going on. And we'll see when we get to Lyatira. That's where I was going to bring that verse up. Uh, the situation gets worse, and uh, and and they're doing essentially the same thing. All right. So very good. So um, you know. So look what happens. He says, if uh, you know, if you don't do something about it, I'm gonna I'm gonna come against them. Right. I'm gonna bring the sword of my mouth against them. I'm gonna bring judgment upon them if you don't do anything about these people. Um, you know. So. Uh, in my mind, it's, you know, if you care for these people, if you love these people, if you are concerned about them, you need to confront their sin. Otherwise, I'm, uh, otherwise Jesus says, I'm going to have to, right? I'm going to have to come down hard on them if you don't go and try to restore them, if you don't and try to uh, pull them back because of the sin that they're involved with. So I think that's an important word for us today. All right. And then he ends up in, uh, <clears throat> in verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the, the Spirit says to the churches. Again, that's repeated after each of these churches. And again, in my mind, that just says, listen, this is serious business. Listen, listen, this is serious business. <clears throat> and then he goes on, to he who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So... <clears throat> This again is repeated several times in these verses. He says, to him who overcomes, and who is that? Jesus. Come on, quicker answers. Let's go. Believers. The world. The believers. It's believers. It's believers, right? If we go back to uh, 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 the verse in John where he talks about uh, those who are overcomers or those who believe. Uh, so these are believers. He's saying all believers this is true of. He says, so he says, to him who overcomes, to the overcomers, to believers... I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone. So first of all, what's the hidden manna? Jesus. Jesus. Good quick answer. <laughs> I like the speed. Why do you say Jesus? Because you said that the other day. And I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that quick enough for you? I have it also. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so you're right in that it is Jesus. Um, but what is it? What what is hidden manna about? What's the story behind that? Anybody remember? I have John six thirty three through thirty five in my notes, so I don't. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually, it's uh, it's a reference back to Exodus sixteen thirty three. We won't go there, uh, but Exodus sixteen thirty three uh, is, is when they were filling the Ark of the Covenant. When they filled the Ark of the Covenant, one of the things they put in there was some of the manna. So this is what this actually being referred to there is the manna that was hidden away in the Ark of the Covenant. And that, again, is, it, you know, it's the bread of life. It is a uh, it is a sign of Christ. Uh, so, yes, he, he is saying that you will get Christ. You will get uh, you will get him. If you overcome, you will get Christ. That's really what he's saying there. <clears throat> you will get the hidden manna. And then he says also, and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written on it. Okay, so what's the white stone? It's like the invitation when you win the race, you're given yeah. yeah. party like. Yeah. 
to be yes. Do you remember that or did you find that at the bottom of your notes? No, I asked one question I answered before that I got right. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We dealt with this before in Daniel. It was one of the things that uh, that, that, that Daniel brought forth. So the white stone. Uh, so when in those days when they had the games, right, whether they, the Olympic games or whatever, uh, when you won, uh, you know, you got the wreath that you put on your head, but you also got a white stone, uh, which could have been any kind of jewel, actually. Uh, and on that stone, they wrote your name and that became your pass into the into the festival. Sorry, some kind of destruction going on in the other room or construction. I'm not sure. Anyway, they gave you this white stone with the name on it, uh, which was your pass into the festival after the games. And so, so it's a beautiful picture for us, right? In that, uh, you know, he who overcomes for all the believers, not only do you get Christ, but you get the admission pass, if you will, into the amazing festival that we call heaven uh, after, uh, uh, after the games. So it's, it's a pretty amazing, a pretty amazing statement. Now, it says that there's a new name written on it that no one knows except him who receives it. So what is that new name? Nobody knows. <laughs> what? Nobody knows, but the one yeah, nobody knows. Good. I was hoping Russell was going to tell me, but he, he, he didn't come through that time. <laughs> you get no white stone today, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. So we we don't know what the what the name is, but uh, you know, each of us will receive a receive a stone. It'll have our new name on it uh, in glory. It's going to be a pretty amazing experience. So uh, th that's really all that's being said there. All right, so that is uh, Pergamus. Any comments or questions about Pergamus before we move on to uh, Thyatira? Welcome, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Got a Walt and a Walter. <laughs> All right, uh, Thyatira, verse 18. <laughs> yeah, and you too, Susie. Well, you, Susie. <laughs> She's, She's one of my uh, puzzle problems. I can't uh, come up with <laughs> <laughs> One of my problems, too, don't <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thyatira, let's get started. Verse 18. We won't finish this today, but we will get into it and uh, see where we get to. So first of all, Thyatira. Um, so as I said, uh, when we're looking at Pergamus, uh, Thyatira is, is essentially you take the problem that you had in Pergamus and you multiply it by 100 and you got Thyatira. It's all the sin in full bloom. Uh, everything that he was worried about in Pergamus, where you had a few people that were following after the uh, this idol worship, and sexual immorality, you now have a large portion of the church in Pergamos who are absorbed in the sin, and frankly, they're just fine with it. They just think it's no big deal. Uh, this is the longest letter that we'll see. Whoa. All right, just something just happened on my computer. Okay, ignore that. Um, <clears throat> this, is the, this is the longest letter uh, written to the smallest church uh, here along the, along the path. So, uh, as I said, with the other churches, we were kind of going up the coast from uh, Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamos. We now go inland uh, to Thyatira. Uh, uh, Thyatira is, uh, let's see. Well, that's a little bit later. I'll wait on that. Um, yeah, so they've tolerated this sin. Uh, you will hear here about this uh, woman of prominence who is teaching in the church and giving us trouble. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Up and down. Um, so what you have here is both, uh, it's an interesting way to look at it, is both spiritual adultery and physical adultery, right? You have uh, spiritual adultery with regard, God, with regard to uh, their um, worshiping of idols, and then you have the physical adultery with the, with the sexual immorality, and again, they're not dealing with it, right? They have a large number of people who have fallen into this sin, and again, you can see again this progression of uh, you know worsening sin as we get into it. You'll see as we get down a little bit further, they talk about these folks are now into the deep things of Satan. Uh, it's gotten pretty bad. All right, let's uh, so let's look at verse verse eighteen. Until the angel of the church of Thyatira write these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like a fine brass. So again, let's look at this description of Christ that is pulled out here. 
again, this is not a fun one, right? <clears throat> Eyes like flame of fire, feet like fine brass. If you go back to our, um, our uh, discussion of chapter one, what was, the, uh, what was the point of the eyes like flames of fire and feet like fine brass? What was the big deal about those things? What did they represent? Is it that he sees our thoughts and intentions? He... Right. And? That's right, and? <clears throat> so eyes like flames of fire are penetrating vision, mm -hmm. right? It's eyes that see into your soul, uh, eyes that see everything, it's eyes that see all your thoughts, all your desires. Uh, and, and this was in the section in uh, chapter one about purity, right? The eyes like flames of fire, the the hair like uh, snow, like wool, and the burnished bronze feet, uh, which trample out impurity. So he's really focusing here on purity and, 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 and bringing forth uh, these, uh, uh, these descriptions that focus on purity, uh, that focus on judgment, if you will. Uh, you know, these, these eyes, everything melts before his gaze. Uh, he, sees, he sees beyond what the world sees, right? And that's going to be important as we look at Thyatira. He sees beyond what the world sees. He sees to the, the, the joint and marrow, right? He sees the guts of it. All of that is, uh, it, you know, when he talks about the, the eyes like flames of fire, feet like fine brass, it's really all about purity. Um, so let's just talk about the city. So Thyatira, <clears throat> again, was a relatively small city. Uh, it was inland. It was in the bottom of a valley. Uh, it was uh, <clears throat> it was the pathway that all of the conquering nations always used to take to get to the water. Um, so if you wanted to get to Pergamus, you would go through Thyatira. Uh, and again, it was just kind of a stopping place for the armies. Uh, they would uh, beat up on the people there. They would take over, and then they would go on to Thyatira, which was the real jewel. Uh, it was the capital city, if you remember. <clears throat> so Thyatira, uh, they constantly had people uh, controlling them, taking them over, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, being in, in being in charge of them, if you will. Uh, I was uh, I was watching a documentary uh, the other day on um, World War II. They were talking about the the Battle of the Bulge, and when the uh, at one point the um, the Russian army came back and took over cities uh, that the that the Allied forces had uh, had freed. And, and they said when they when they were on their retreat, they saw that the people in the city had already changed the flags uh, back to Nazi flags, uh, recognizing that they they were going to come in and get taken over again. I think this is the people of Thyatira, right? They had another somebody coming in to take them over, and they tried to live within that situation that they were in. Um, but again, it was uh, it was a commercial city. Uh, it was known for its wool. It had a dyeing dyeing, uh, you know, making dyes. Uh, they dyed material. Uh, they had uh, a, uh, the largest number of trade guilds in the city, which becomes important because <clears throat> each of the trade guilds had their own god. Um, and, and if you were in the trade guild, then you worship that god. Um, uh, and if you wanted to be in the trade guild, you had to worship that god. So if you wanted to work in the city of Thyatira uh, in one of the trades, uh, that meant that you would have to worship one of those gods and see, and you will get back into that in a minute. So this is one of the issues that they have here. Uh, Thyatira is still, still around, has a different name. It's got about 25,000 inhabitants, inhabitants. Uh, so again, a relatively small city. We do have one reference to Thyatira. If you go back to Acts chapter 16, there. Sixteen fourteen. Acts sixteen fourteen. It says. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, 
who worship God, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken of by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. So this is uh, this is Lydia. She's from Thyatira. As you mentioned, she was a seller of purple, right? So that, that fits in with this idea that they were uh, they were in the dyeing business. Uh, not a dying business, but they were dying in the business. Uh, I don't know how to say that right. Anyway, you know what I mean. They made dyed purple. Uh, she was from Thyatira. Uh, so here she's been, uh, you know, she worshiped the Lord, but now she has been, had her op eyes open to the gospel. And she asked the, um, uh, you know, she asked Paul and his group to come to her city. And so it's very likely that this is when the church at Thyatira was born. Uh, that that uh, Lydia brought Paul and his group back to Thyatira. They founded the church there, probably in her home, right? It's a home church, uh, and, and, and Lydia was probably the founder of that church. So that's about all we know about, about, uh, about uh, the beginnings of the church is from that uh, one verse there, uh, two verses there in, uh, in Acts. All right, so let's go on then and look at the common... Uh, the commendation for uh, Lydia, which uh, there's not much of, but it's in verse 19. So again, he says, I know your works. That's a consistent message that he has to all the churches. And again, we've, we've spent some time on that, but uh, he knows your works. <laughs> uh, just as he knows these churches' works, he knows your works. He says, I, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. So this is a pretty nice commendation that he gives to these, this church, right? I know that I know of your love. I know that of your charity. I know that you have love for one another. I know of your service, that you're doing things, that you're working in the community, uh, that you're helping people. I know of your faith, which might better be um, translated faithfulness. I, I know of your faithfulness. You've been consistent. Uh, you've stayed with it. I know of your patience or perseverance, your endurance, right? All of that. Um, and as for your works, the last are more than your first. In fact, you're doing more works now. You're, you're doing more service now. You're even, even more involved in the community now. The, the community has, has, a, has you in a great reputation, right? They, they look at you as a church and say, wow, this is a great church. They love one another. Uh, they're, they're, they've persevered. They, have, uh, they, they serve the community. Uh, this is a really great church. So they have a, a great reputation in the church. So that's the commendation. However, there comes verse 20. <laughs> uh, mine starts with nevertheless, uh, you know, could just say, but, uh, but I have a few things against you. So again, that statement has just got to cut them to the quick, right? They're thinking, man, we are this great church, right? Everybody loves us. We're doing all this stuff, but... I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So who is this woman Jezebel? <clears throat> Leader in the church. Calls herself a prophetess. She's teaching in the church. Now, now, so let's just be straight up. We don't know who this person is, um, and it's very likely that Jezebel <laughs> is not her real name. Uh, he's just calling her Jezebel uh, after the story in the Old Testament. Anybody remember the story in the Old Testament of Jezebel? You want to give it to us? This is the quiz time of the class. <laughs> Yeah, she was the king's wife. Yes, she was the king's wife. What was the king? Ahab. Ahab. Good. And what was what? Why is she a problem? Well, she had all the prophets of Baal and uh, killed all the uh, all of the uh, legitimate prophets. Right. And then did what? That's right. And then, uh, then, then she pursued Elijah after Elijah killed the 400 prophets of Baal after the uh, uh, 
God had brought down uh, fire and uh, consumed his uh, uh, the contest between the prophet of Baal and, 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 uh, and Elijah uh, consumed his uh, altar. Yeah, and then she went on to lead the rest of the Israelites to commit sexual immorality and worship idols, right? So that so that's what so that was her main thrust. She was, uh, you know, Ahab was uh, a terrible king, but when you connected her and Jezebel together, they were a real force uh, that essentially turned all the Israelites uh, to uh, false religion, uh, to worshiping idols, to committing sexual immorality. And you do remember that this whole issue with worshiping idols was that they were often connected to sexual immorality, right? It was part of the worship, was they had, uh, uh, you know, they, they had um, uh, females that were there to, uh, uh, to, to, in order to worship, you had to commit a sexual act uh, that was part of their worship. So th that was absolutely uh, what Jezebel brought to uh, the Israelites was that, that whole worship of uh, idols, which included sexual immorality. So, so here, what we have in uh, in verse twenty, saying similarly, you have a Jezebel there in your church, and that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, is teaching uh, teaching my servants, teaching and seducing my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So she's doing the same thing that she, that this that the original Jezebel did. Uh, was that was you know she's leading them into idol worship and sexual immorality. Now, if you look in the middle of that verse, it says that she's teaching and seducing my servants to do that. Uh, is it is it possible to lead Christians astray? <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. If it's a social socialized thing, I mean, if the government gets involved to make <laughs> make you do certain things. You know, it impacts everybody. That may not be the answer you want, though. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, Russell, we wouldn't sin, right? Just only, only government makes us sin. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter six. Just to remind you. First Corinthians chapter six, verse fifteen. So remember, 1 Corinthians is written to the church, written to Christians. This is not written to non-believers, right? So 1 Corinthians, whatever I said, 6.15, it says, Do not know that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. So he is dealing with the same issue, and Bill pointed out earlier, we're dealing with the same issue in Corinthians, uh, with the Corinthian church uh, uh, in Paul's day, that we're, de we're dealing with the Thyatira church in, uh, uh, you know, 40 years later, uh, when, when John writes Revelation. Uh, you've got these folks who are um, having uh, sexual sin with, uh, with harlots. Uh, you see the same thing here. So yes, you can lead Christians astray. Yes, uh, Christians still sin. Uh, no question about that. Now, I will ask you this, and, and, and Russell, this may be closer to really where you were going. Um, and, and that is that how in the world could this woman teach these Christians that this was okay? Right? Somehow she is corrupting these Christians and saying, it's okay for you to commit sexual immorality. It's okay for you to, to do idol worship. How is she doing that? By making it a law that you have to do it. How? What, what do you mean, Russell? Well, you'd rebel against the, the government. If you don't do certain things, certain practices, then you're, you're going against the law that she that, has. Obviously, that, she has political influence. But is that true in Thyatira? Well, they allowed Jezebel. I mean, yeah, the, I mean, church, yeah. the church did. What do we know about Thyatira that might connect this? Are you referring back to all the gods of the hills, each having their own practice? Yes, right? 
Excuse yeah. me, what do you mean on that? She says, listen, guys, uh, you know, if you wanna if you wanna work, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to worship these idols. You're gonna have to be and when that and that includes the sexual sin. And you know, listen, if you want to give to the church, you gotta have money. Uh, the only way you have money is you gotta have to work. So you're gonna have to get into the sexual sin so that you can support God's work. Right? Can't you see that? Yeah. Right? I, I mean you can absolutely see this. And by the way, uh, it's only the spiritual things in your life that are important, not the physical things. Uh, and, and by the way, you're under grace. You're not under the law. I mean, <laughs> ah, you can just see how easy this is. Um, and by the way, learning all these things about Satan will help you in your witness, right? You know more about sin, so therefore you can witness better because, you know, I mean, all of these, these are old lies of Satan. Right, all these things are old lies of Satan uh, that are being repeated here in Thyatira by this woman. Uh, by the way, she it's notice that it says she calls herself a prophetess. Right, it doesn't say she is a prophet. She calls herself a prophetess. She says she has a word from God, and that word from God is, oh, it's okay, it's all right for you to do this. There are many people today who call themselves messengers of God and say they have a word from God and it's okay to do this, it's okay to do that, etc. And this is exactly what we got here. Okay, makes sense? <clears throat> All right, let's keep going. So you have this woman, um, da, 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 did we cover everything in 20? Yes. All right, verse 21. So I gave her time, indeed, uh, yeah, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. So I gave. So so uh, Jesus is saying here, I gave her time to repent. I gave her an opportunity to repent, and she did not. In other words, the time has passed for her to repent. I, I get just because I love this verse. Uh, turn there uh, to uh, John chapter three. This is one of those verses I can't get over. <clears throat> John chapter three, verse nineteen. I'm in the wrong book. John chapter 3, verse 19. Right? 319. Mine says, is it, and this is the common day, condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Right? Men love that darkness. So here you have this woman Jezebel teaching these things and 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 jesus has given her time to repent but she did not repent why not because she loved those evil things she loved her sin she loved the sin that she was involved with and therefore would not repent uh, i don't know there's nothing more to be said on that but that that's uh, that that truism is uh is uh should break your heart right for for the world this is why they cannot turn to christ this is why they cannot accept the gospel because they just love their sin uh they they just love it too much all right we are uh at a point that would be good to stop uh by the clock and by what we're about to get into because what we're going to happen here in the following verses, the end up Tyre Tyra is his judgment upon them. And we got to be clear about that because he talks about judgment of um, Jezebel. He also talks about judgment of those who have followed her in sin. And he also talks about judgment of those who um, act just like her. And so we got to parse that correctly so that you understand exactly what that means for us, frankly. Uh, because there, <clears throat> there are some of you in the room who still sin. <laughs> so, so we need to be clear about that as we, as we get into those details. So we'll do that next week, and then we'll get um, into uh, um, the dead church at Sardis uh, following that. <clears throat> All right, anything else before we close? Say, I'm, I'm checking, I haven't checked with... I Stephanie did. and Danny yet about their, they were the choice of restaurant if they're around on the 18th. We think we are. So I think it'll be Saisaki Asian Bistro in Kiln, in Kiln Creek. 
All right, sounds good. Do we need, do we need chopsticks? Uh, they're probably furnishing for you. Okay, good. I won't bring my own gold plated ones. Yes, you do. You can bring them. I'll use them. Actually, when I was uh, I visited uh, Korea uh, probably ten years ago, and uh, visited with one of the uh, people in Parliament there, and they gave me this gift of golden chopsticks. Uh, actually. And so as a government employee, I can't accept such a thing, right? So I had to take, bring them home and actually uh, give them to the center director as a gift from the, uh, from the, uh, the government of South Korea. Uh, I would like to have just sold them. They would have been, uh, they would have been. <laughs> no, I don't have any golden chopsticks anymore. I had them for, for a couple of days. Anyway, y'all have a great week. Uh, love you. We'll talk to you then. Bye. 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 Bye.